this is the most conceptually demanding portion. It's not that difficult, but I just want to be able to sort test. through these very basic concepts that are going to be so critical for you uh, in, your, in your clinical uh, your clinical study. Part of our problem is our, our or our task is aggravated by the fact that we haven't really talked about the relationship between pressure, volume, and flow, and all of that velocity. We'll do that momentarily. Um, but with that in mind, let's let's see if we can talk a little bit about venous return, central venous pressure, and some of the principles that are related to those that you need to keep in mind. Finally, to, 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 to uh, okay. conclude my introduction, it's important to understand that anything I say on these matters is an extreme simplification. The, the principles we're talking, or we'll be talking about here, is something, something called guidance laws or guidance principles that have been around for decades in, in, in the origin of this textbook. And they're fundamental concepts in what is called physical chemistry, pressure volume relationships. Now, <clears throat> guidance principles are still found in all the textbooks. What we found, what has been found in recent years, is that while empirically Guyton's results hold, his explanations are probably, or there's a very high probability that they're not correct. We've learned, for example, that a lot of the phenomena that we'll be describing or talking about with respect to cardiovascular function and also with you know, peripheral blood flow is more a function of the this this very peculiar mucosa of the anterior vascular lining. Remember our discussion of glycocalyx earlier? Glycocalyx is a, a polysaccharide, mucopolysaccharide film that lines the bronchial passageways, the GI tract, the genitory organ system. Well, that's present in the, all the blood vessels of your body too, and it seems, at least again, there's a great deal of evidence to suggest that a number of guidance findings or guidance generalities have more to do with the properties of the, you know, the vascular endothelium or the vascular mucosa than they do to the, the contractile properties of the heart. But having said that, let's, let's just uh, discuss a few general and classical principles. All right, first on our list is venous return. Previously, we talked about right atrial pressure. So it's important to differentiate return and pressure. Return is a volume. And whether you wish to understand volume as just so many millimeters or so many liters, or as a flow, and by flow we mean amount over time, that's not terribly important right now. But be sure you're able to differentiate pressure from volume. So what do we mean by vascular pressure? What is vascular pressure? At any point? Force exerted. It's force. It's a hydrostatic force. By hydrostatic force, we mean it's the force of the fluid inside the blood vessel or inside the chamber of the heart that is pushing against the walls of that chamber or vessel. That's the pressure. That's a hydrostatic pressure. So right atrial pressure is the pressure of the blood pushing against the walls of the, of the atrium. By contrast, when we talk about uh, venous return, we're only talking about a volume now. Sometimes they're related and sometimes they're not they're entirely related. So if you appreciate that, um, uh, we can usually state that over the long haul, over the long term, BR is going to be equivalent to CO. Cardiac output and venous return should be comparable rates. May not be right now as you're sitting there at your desk. That is to say, one, one or the other may be larger, but over time, average day, over a matter of minutes to hours, if they don't equal, well, you're, you're going to be in some kind of severe cardiovascular uh, distress. And is it clear why that's the case? Cardiac output is the volume over time of the blood leaving the heart. Venous return is the volume over time of the blood returning to the heart. So it's a conservation principle. If, we, if they're not equal, then we're either losing blood or you're, you're like me on weekends, you're drinking too much, right? You're, you're taking in too, many, too much fluid. All right, so make sure you appreciate that fundamental principle. And we, and we talked about this before a moment ago as well. Venous return varies directly with breath, varies directly with right atrial pressure under normal circumstances. 
And that's because, again, the, the heart is the central pressure generator pumping the blood through the circuit of the body or the, or the lungs. And the volume and the pressure are going to be more or less uh, covariant up to a point. And now here's where things are a little, bit a little bit trickier, and I want you to do some mental arithmetic. We'll come back and talk about this curve in just a moment, but that's what we're talking about as I ask you to do a few little mental experiments. All right. What's, a, what's your blood pressure right now? What's a normal human blood pressure? 90 over 120. Yeah, 120 over 80. That's your systolic over diastolic. Systolic is the contractile pressure. Diastolic is the pressure of relaxation. We'll work through that a little more later. All right. And we've, we've established that your heart is the central pressure generator. It's generating that uh, mean arterial pressure. Later on, you'll, you'll calculate mean arterial pressure, but it'll be 93 or about 93. So we're saying the mean arterial pressure uh, is 120 over 80 is about 90. And your, your heart is performing that work. All right. Suppose I were to um, take your heart out and put in place of your heart a mouse heart. What's the problem with replacing your heart with the heart of a mouse? It's too small. Mouse heart beats more rapidly. Yes, any, any stimulus, any. any All right, the mouse heart is not going to be able to exert enough pressure and, and uh, uh, generate enough force to propel the blood from one side of the heart, from the ventricular side to the right atrium side, from the left ventricle to the right atrium. It's just not going to have enough force, right? So you're going you're, you're to die. All right, so if that's true, uh, and I need lots of, I need, you know, I need a heart that's capable of performing a much higher workload. All right, so I've learned my lesson. I'm going to take an elephant heart and replace your heart with an elephant heart. Would that work? No. Any downside to that? Well, you're going to have plenty of cardiac reserve. <laughs> I heard some of you say, so what, what would be the downside? Just, you know, whoosh, whoosh, and your blood just Flowing, zipping through, your eyes are bulging, veins are distending. It's like these, like these astronauts on these science fiction movies that get sent into sent into space and they just explode. Of course, that doesn't really happen. Um, is it clear then? Yes, every capillary system in your body would not be able to handle the pressure. The, the cerebral capillaries would go, the renal capillaries would go, the peripheral capillaries would be too much pressure. So, what I want you to gather from that that silly little experiment is that your your human heart is designed. To provide just enough perfusion pressure to get the blood from the ventricle, the left ventricle, back to the right atrium, and by the time, so what's the pressure of the blood that's that's uh, passing into the the right atrium? Very, it's very 93 fast. leaving. What is it going to do? Uh, All right, so yeah, we'll say single. Let's just say close to zero. And why is that? Because your heart is designed just for to provide just enough pressure to get all the way around that circuit. If it's too high, by the way, we think this is now one of the major causes of, the, of, of, of dementia. In fact, I think it's, there's a whole journal in Australia devoted to the, what's it called, the Congopathic Theory of Alzheimer's Disease. That basically, throughout your life, your heart's going pump, 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 and it's causing those cerebral capillaries to throb. Eventually, they just stay to heck with it and give up and explode. And that's, that's the theory, uh, that's their AD theory down there way down under. Um, <clears throat> but the idea is, again, you want just enough perfusion pressure to get that blood back to the, the right atrium. And uh, you get very, very low pressure. That's what we're talking about, central venous pressure. So is that clearly, the, 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 our, our premise here is the heart is doing just enough to get the job done. And if it does too much, we're gonna, there's going to be cardiovascular damage, usually capillary damage. If it's not doing, if it doesn't exert enough pressure, then there's going to be hypoperfusion of critical tissues such as the kidney and the brain and so on. All right. So venous return is this volume returning to the to the um, heart at very very low central venous pressure. 
The heart is generating a mean arterial pressure about 93. So we're going, let's say 93 to, let's say 93 to 100. So uh, we'll say here's our little circuit. We'll say it's 93 millimeters on this side. We'll say it's zero just to make it simple on this side. What's, what's causing the delta P? Oh, that's not a delta, is it? What's generating the delta P? What's responsible for the delta P from 93 to zero? The heart. The heart. The heart is creating them. I just want to make sure. All right. Now, what happens in our little circuit here if I go from 93 to 50? Very high pressure coming back into the heart. Why would that be? Because what's happened to our delta P? Is it gone up or down? Down. Down. Remember, what's the what's the function of that pressure gradient? What, what's the heart doing generating a delta P, a pressure gradient, a pressure difference sufficient to perfuse, perfuse the entire tissues? <coughs> now, pressure, is it clear to you if the pressure on the right atrial side is elevated, <coughs> all right, that's effectively a resistance that's impeding the movement of blood into the other side. Is that clear? So suppose it were 93 over here. Suppose we go again from 93 to 93. Would there be any movement of blood at all? No. No. So the point that I want you to get from this is that there is a critical delta P. There is a critical difference in pressure that must be conserved. It must be maintained. And that critical pressure is necessary to perfuse the tissues in the body. And if the right atrial pressure, if right atrial pressure is higher than normal, let's say greater than single digits, then the delta P is reduced and perfusion is diminished. And that's going to have adverse consequences. So let's go to this little figure right here. Uh, let's not worry about the blue one. Let's focus on the red one now. So the, it, we have a graph here, cardiac output and venous return. So let's focus on the venous return. Because we know that when there's only circumstances, they're going to be equal. And then we have right atrial pressure here. So looking at the red line, not the blue line, but the red line, what happens as we increase right atrial pressure? What happens to venous return. It goes down. It's up here. And what happens as we increase it? It goes down. Is it clear to you why that would be in theory? All right. That's, that's the, one of the fundamental guidance principles that I want you to be familiar with. That delta P is critical to maintain adequate perfusion through the tissues. Uh, the cardiac function curve is a little more complicated than we have time to get into. Uh, let's go back to uh, let's go back to this this line. Um, so this is a list of factors modifying venous return. Let's see if we can work through some of these. Some of these ought to be more evident than others. Uh, venous return is going to be increased as uh, as physical activity increases. All right. Why would that be? Somebody explain that to me. Why would venous return increase with an increase in physical activity? Uh, Higher pressure. Well, muscular venous, but, but what is the implication? Increased output. Yeah, increased cardiac output. Remember, uh, the muscular venous pumping would increase because of the increased activity. And of course, to accommodate the increased activity, there's going to be an increase in uh, increase in cardiac output. Heart rate goes up and uh, contractility goes up. Uh, venous return tends to vary inversely with total peripheral resistance. What was total, what was the rest of that term mean, TPR? Yeah, I remember I was getting ready to push Trenton. He was, he's a refractory non-compliant student, and we have to, we have to modify his behavior with medications, drugs, and whatever is necessary. I, it's the electric fish hooks that I've been recommending. That's what we have to. All right, so that, we have another name for that. What was, the, what was our other name for TPR? Yeah, after load. So what we're saying is that as we increase the afterload, that's going to impede the flow of blood from the 
ventricle back to the atrium, right? And so is it clear to everyone why venous return, the volume of blood passing back to the heart is gonna be diminished as the resistance increases? Um, so this one may, be, may seem inconsistent with this one. So let's see if we can work out the difference here. It says, oops, it says venous compliance tends to vary inversely with venous return. I think a better way of thinking about this would maybe be thinking about sympathetic activation. So in sympathetic activation, what happens to heart rate and contractility? Both increase, okay? Um, that may or may not be the case up here, but what we're suggesting in sympathetic activation is cardiac output is gonna go up as heart rate and stroke volume. And then there may also be associated with that, depending on a variety of, uh, variety, variety of circumstances, peripheral vasoconstriction. Constriction. And when that happens, notice the difference between the first point there. Uh, with sympathetic activation, we get elevated cardiac output and elevated venous return. Uh, so let's let me see if I can do this. So we'll say this is a cardiac output, and this is venous return, and they should normally be equal, right? All right, in the one case, a little exaggerated here. I've introduced a stricture down here, All right? So cardiac output, venous return. What's going to be the effect on venous return here? Is it going to be necessarily equivalent to cardiac output? At the, at the point in time that that stricture is introduced, yeah. no, venous return is going to decrease as a consequence. Okay, but the difference in when we talk about sympathetic activation is cardiac output is going up dramatically. All right, so cardiac output has gone up dramatically. The pressure has gone up. Force of contraction has gone up. Contractility of eye has gone up. And that is usually going to be sufficient to compensate for the small restriction, the, the relatively small vasoconstriction that may be associated with the sympathetic activation. So let's go back to this figure here. Uh, during sympathetic activation, cardiac output goes up, pressure goes up, contractility goes up, and venous return increases simply because the change in the activity of the heart is greater than the resistance uh, imposed by the vasoconstriction, the peripheral vasoconstriction. As I say, part of our problem now is we really haven't talked about the pressure volume flow relationships yet, and I think this will become clearer as we get to that discussion a little later. Uh, we don't need to worry too much about uh, the changes with inhalation, but let's talk a little bit about uh, this final example here, and we've talked about this before. Anybody remember that? What is that? That orthostatic hypotension. Right, remember you're on the bench, you're on the weight bench, you're lying down, and suddenly you start you're lifting weights and you're, you're having your way with the weights, but uh, you get tired and you stand up, and then suddenly you're on the and you're having a little bit of dizziness, vertigo, tunnel vision. Why is that? What's happened to venous return when you stood up and dried? Is that clear? So let's be able to express these phenomena in the, in the lexicon in the terms that we're talking about. So venous return will be diminished as a consequence. Now, let's look at it conversely. I'm standing here, and now I drop to the floor. I'm going to lie down on the floor. What's going to happen to venous return then, and why? Is the heart having to work as hard? Is the heart having to work? No. And so venous return is going to increase a little bit initially. By the way, the, the most common mistake on tests when we talk about orthostatic hypertension is differentiating this process from the compensatory process. So orthostatic hypertension, I stand up, I get dizzy, 
Um, how does the body compensate for that? Increase heart rate. Through what? Through what uh, mechanism? Uh, it's going to be reduce the uh, increase the. No. What? Uh, what is taking? What you don't have to think about it. You don't have to say you take heart. Heart. Cut it. Cut it up an ounch. Yeah, I don't know. Make nervous. System. All right, so it's going to be the sympathetic activation. So please be sure you understand when we, when we talk about this. The orthostatic hypotension, the tunnel vision, the vertigo, uh, the momentary distress, is a result of the changes in cardiac function accompanying that gravitational work, alteration, gravitational load we placed on the heart. But normally, most of you would then oh, just a second, or perhaps, or even less than that. The sympathetic nervous system will kick in, but that certain sympathetic compensation occurs after the orthostatic hypertension, in response to the orthostatic hypertension. So that's what's that's what's going on down here. Um, the the right atrial pressure preload both decrease. Stroke volume decreases, and as a consequence, you may become dizzy for a moment. But then the uh, the sympathetic nervous system will kick in and compensate. By the way, uh, we should be familiar with this term too, because uh, I'm not sure how much time we're going to talk about all of these things. Compliance, you can see, is formally defined both in really in any physical sense system as delta V over delta P. So it's a change in volume associated with a change in pressure. So we say, for example, that the veins are more compliant than the arteries because when we change the pressure imposed onto a vein, it changes shape. The delta V is greater than it would be in an artery. An artery, if we change the pressure, it's not going to, the tunnel is being equal. It has a thick, robust arterial wall uh, that's going to resist the change in pressure. You know, this wall is not compliant, it's quite trend. It's not compliant. It's not going to yield, not going to move. Um, whereas if I, you know, I pull out my wallet and start passing out the Benjamins, maybe I can, maybe I can enhance the compliance. Uh, so veins are compliant. Veins are compliant. Arteries are much less so. But formally, it's just delta V, the change in volume that corresponds to the change in pressure. You also need to know that the veins are considerably more compliant. You can see uh, they're about 20 times more compliant uh, than the arteries. And then as a consequence, and this is the point I'm getting to here, the veins under normal circumstances hold about 60 to 70 percent of the blood in the body at any given time because they yield to the pressure. So they are the venous, they, they're called the venous pool. They're basically uh, because of their compliance, um, able to take up the, able to take up most of the vascular blood. Okay, so we talked about venous return. Let's talk a little bit about central venous pressure. It harken back to our discussion of the mouse heart and the elephant heart. We said that uh, the human heart has to be able to generate a pressure for delta P of uh, roughly 90 to 100 millimeters of mercury under normal circumstances. All right, and so that the pressure returning to the right atrium from the left ventricle, pressure returning to the right atrium, we talked about RAP, and we saw the graph there. We saw zero plus one plus two plus three. That central venous pressure is, nom is nominal. It's very, very low in the single digits. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. Central venous pressure is very, very low. It's going to be affected by a variety of things. Um, one thing that will affect the central venous pressure, and pressure more generally, is bovemia. What is bovemia? Emia? Volume of, yeah, the volume of the blood. And so again, you, you can drink sitting here like I do on weekends and increase the volume of the blood, that's going to increase peripheral blood pressure. It's also going to increase uh, central venous pressure. The blood volume, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, volemia, hypervolemia can do that. Hypovolemia, if a patient is bleeding out, the blood pressure is going to go down, the venous return is going to decrease uh, for that reason. Uh, gravity, we've talked about orthostatic hypotension and the effects on venous return. That should be evident to you now, but just remember the difference between pressure and volume. What's the volume? If I were to ask you on a test to tell me the volume of blood returning to the heart, what is what's the volume of blood returning to the right atrium? Same as the lung. Same as cardiac output. We'll talk about five to six liters, whatever. 
I'll, we'll talk about that later. Now, so CO and VR are about the same over, over average over time. But is the pressure of the blood leaving the ventricle equivalent to the pressure of the blood returning to the right atrium? Absolutely. No, big difference. So again, don't confuse the pressure delta P with delta delta D. All right, so I just want you to understand again the general concept, and let's talk a little bit about what are called these uh, these uh, uh, atrial uh, pressure uh, pressure gradients, sometimes referred to as the A wave and the V wave. Now, is there a valve between the between the left ventricle and the aorta? Is there a valve? It's the aortic valve. Is there a valve between the, the right atrium and the jugular vein? No. So we have a very, very important difference there. So when the atrium contracts, even though the contraction is not particularly powerful, when the atria contracts during late systole, what would you expect might happen to the pressure of the venous blood, not only in the right atrium, but also in the vena cava and even in the jugular. Increases. It's going to increase with contraction. And there you go. That's the A wave. You will eventually learn, perhaps, to use that clinically. That's a, that can be a clinical measure because the, if the right side of the heart is hypertrophic or in distress, sometimes there'll be a white heart hypertrophy or elevated pressure in the right heart. And that might show up as a more or less continuous or chronic distension of the jugular vein, all right? So A wave just refers to the contraction uh, or the increase in pressure that accompanies the, the contraction of the atrium. All right, so uh, V wave is a little bit different, but basically the same principle. Um, you know that, of course, the atrioventricular valve is the valve separating the atrium and the ventricle. Um, I'm going to shrink you down, like they did the fantastic voyage with Raquel Welch back in the 1960s or whatever. And I'm going to have you stand on the AV valve. I'm going to stand right there on the AV, the AV valve. Now, when the ventricle contracts, what's going to happen to the atrioventricular valve? Closes. It's going to close. All right. You're still standing there. You're, you, you, you're, you've got the appropriate uh, suit to withstand all of the pressure gradients. You're standing on the you're standing on the AV valve. Now, as the as the ventricle continues into systole, and it does so rather rapidly, as you know. Is the AV is the annulus fibrosus of the corneum. The valve uh, is it likely to go up or down? Into the yes, yeah, likely to elevate into the atrium. And as it does so, it pushes the blood, the atrial blood, we'll say back into the vena cava and into the jugular vein. That's your V wave. So the V wave corresponds to ventricular contraction. The A wave corresponds to atrial contraction. And both of these, again, as I've indicated, especially in right heart failure, uh, can be used. I mean, in the old days, they used to put the patient on the inclined table, head below the head below the heart, and you could watch the degree to which the jugular vein distended, uh, especially with certain maneuvers, to, to sort of get an assessment of, of right heart function. All right, any questions about that's the tough stuff. The rest of, the rest of this is pretty easy. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about pressure volume relationships. What we're going to be talking about now, if you look at the, uh, the title of this, we've been talking about the heart, basically cardiac function. We've, we've worked through these rather recondite concepts of venous return and central venous pressure. Keep in mind the fundamental premise underlying our, all of our discussion to this point. Your heart is the pressure generator that regulates pressure centrally. Blood flow is regulated peripherally. And by flow, we mean amount over time. We know that the pressure, the delta P, the heart generating the, the difference in pressure, is needed to propel the blood through the uh, aorta, arteries, <coughs> arterioles, capillaries, venule veins, and so on. But what we're going to find is that flow is regulated peripherally by a variety of mechanisms independent of the heart. 
So to work through all that, let's quickly uh, review our discussion of these very, very basic principles of flow. Flow, again, is the volume per unit time. And if we have no other constraints, and this is what, what students sometimes find, uh, find uh, difficult, if there are no other constraints, then flow and pressure are directly related. Flow and pressure are going to be directly related if there are no other factors to consider. Unfortunately for you, there are other factors. And the most important other factor is the size of the blood vessel. When we change the size of the blood vessel, that first principle goes out the window. All right, before we get to that, make sure you know the definition of velocity. This is like the speedometer in your car. It's distance over time. And we've already talked about resistance. Resistance is in teams, or it's the, it's the, um, it's the anything that opposes the flow of blood. So, for example, it could be a vascular restriction, it could be a plumb, it could be uh, an obstacle in the in obstacle in the, in the blood vessel. It could be any number of things. But um, and we're going to find that resistance varies with the size of the vessel and with some other factors as well. Now, in this little figure down here. We can see a very simple uh, flow, or a very simple formula. Velocity is proportional to Q over A. Now, Q, we've run, we've run across that before. What was that? Yeah, this is our, we're going to come back to the VQ ratio. V stands for airflow or ventilation, and the Q stands for blood flow. Now, more generally, and this is what's confusing, it's going to be blood in this case. Um, but in this case, we're saying that velocity is related or proportional to flow divided by area of the conductor. So if you look at our, our little figure there, and we'll, we have some other formulas. So what happens to velocity as we increase the size of the blood vessel, the size of the conductor? What happens to velocity? It decreases. Now make sure you understand that. As we narrow the blood vessel, the velocity increases. As we narrow the blood vessel, the velocity of blood flow increases. I have a garden hose up here, and I want to, I want to, Wake Georgia, and what can I do? My little my little garden hose. I go up to the, the uh, faucet and I turn the, the the water flow all the way on, but it only shoots out a small distance. What can I do to get my garden hose to get everybody in the back row there? Exactly right. I can put my thumb across the end of the garden hose. I'm reducing the size of the opening, and what's happening? The velocity of that restriction going up, all right? Now make sure you understand this. This is going to be very critical in our ensuing discussion. Uh, you should also know, as we um, continue our discussion of blood flow, that the longer the blood vessel, the longer the conductor, the greater the resistance. The longer the vessel, the greater the resistance or impedance presented to the flow of blood. Yeah, I'm sure I don't know what that would be, um, but that wouldn't surprise me at all. On the other hand, have you ever seen, um, we, can take, we can maybe use the example of a drinking straw. If I have, um, I, I really have a, some delicious lemonade, and uh, because I'm concerned about putting my lips to the periphery of the container or vessel in which the lemonade, lemonade is contained, I'm going to use a drinking straw to, to bring the lemonade into my, into my mouth. So in order to do that most efficient, efficiently, would it be better to have to use one single straw or maybe 10 straws put together, bound together, so I can just, you've seen cigarette smokers do this too, right? Just, which would be more efficient? How am I going to get more um, 
lemonade into my mouth at a given rate, at a given rate, at a given period of time. With ten straws, I would walk. One. Ten. 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 <laughs> but I want you to, for some reason, folks have, have trouble with this. What we're saying is, the more parallel vessels I have, the more vessels I have in parallel, the lower the resistance and the greater the flow. And this is going to come up both in the cardiovascular discussion and in the pulmonary discussion. As I increase the number of vessels, the number of blood vessels or conductors, I increase the overall area. And as I increase the overall area, I change both the velocity and the flow. And I decrease the resistance. Um, George had that example. The one I think of, I think it's somebody in Cape Coral years ago, a fellow wanted to clean the bottom of his swimming pool, and uh, he needed to get to the bottom of the pool, but he thought it would be helpful to be able to breathe down there while he was working on the end of the structure brain or something. So he took the garden hose with him. And his, his, his theory was that when he, when he had a little block here, he increased the, the, his weight so that he could remain um, at the bottom of the pool, but it wouldn't be a problem because he had the garden hose. Um, what's the problem there? Yeah, that garden hose did not have, so there was a number of problems. The garden hose, at the very least, did not have a sufficient radius to allow enough air. Basically, for a number of reasons, whatever he breathed out, he's breathing right back in. But even more importantly, uh, there was too much impedance, there was too much resistance presented by that very narrow opening. It'd be like you breathing through a straw, right? can't breathe through a straw effectively. You, you do it for a while, and then your eyes close. <laughs> so to understand these fundamental relationships, be sure you understand the relationship between uh, serial resistance, parallel resistance. Resistance increases as we increase the length of the uh, blood vessel. Resistance decreases as we increase the number of parallel blood vessels. So this little graph here is a graph of pressure at various points in the, in the uh, vascular system. Why don't we begin? Well, let's, uh, let's, uh, we were standing on the AV valve a moment ago. Let's uh, go ahead and drop through the valve and stand right there in the ventricle. And the ventricle is contracting back and forth. And what I want you to appreciate as you're standing in that ventricle is the pressure gradient is massive. We're going from virtually zero, not quite zero, but virtually zero, all the way up to the systolic pressure of 120 millimeters of mercury. And it's going back and forth, back and forth. That's the peculiar pulsatile nature of the human heart. Some of these new artificial hearts may be relevant for you as a PA, but that per because perhaps you will encounter more individuals with these things. They will have no apparent pulse pressure. If you look at the, uh, if you look at our definition of pulse pressure here, it's the difference between um, systole and diastole. Why? Some of these artificial hearts just generate a constant pressure. They're not pulsatile. Unless your patient wouldn't have any apparent pulse. That could be distressful. The patient is walking around without a pulse. Um, but in any case, in the ventricle, there's this dramatic change in pressure. Then we get up here, let's call this the aorta here. Let's say it's about right there. And at that point, we now do have a pulse pressure. Again, the pulse pressure is the difference between systole and diastole, in this case, 120 and 80. Why does the pressure never drop below 80 in the aorta when it drops almost to zero in the ventricle? The difference there. The volume left the ventricle. I'm sorry? The volume left the ventricle and there's still volume in the aorta. All right, so um, the pressure is going up and down, up and down. It goes all the way up into the aorta. We still get the we still get the systolic pressure increase. Uh, but what pre I guess what I'm asking is what prevents that pressure from dropping all the way back to almost zero again? Huh? The aortic valve. I want to make sure you understand 
that when we discharge that blood out here to the hole, that's my squeaky door. That's the way my bones sound going up and down the stairs. All right. So I push all the blood, blood, uh, blood out. Remember, in order to get the blood from the ventricle into the aorta, uh, the pressure in the ventricle has to exceed the pressure in the aorta. Remember in our rigors diagram, what was the pressure in that aorta? Remember the black line up there at the top? At the very least, you remember the black line was the highest, right? Yeah. All right so it's way on up there. Right, that's, that's static pressure. It doesn't change. It changes a little bit, but it doesn't change very much as soon as you drop below that point. So the ventricle has to push the blood against that pressure. That's the total peripheral resistance. We haven't done the name for it a moment ago. What was it? The afterload. All right. And then when the pressure in the ventricle starts to drop, what happens? Slam, the valve closes, the pressure out there remains high. So I want you to understand it's the activity, the action of that aortic valve that keeps this pressure from dropping. Of course, if the valve is compromised, if it's, uh, if it's uh, insufficient or incompetent, then that pressure may well drop. All right, so that's very important. Make sure you understand, number one, why that diastolic pressure remains high, distal to the aortic valve. Be sure you know the definition of pulse pressure. Now, what I noticed here, and this is a problem, this is a very difficult uh, uh, point sometimes related to what we're looking at here, but I noticed that pulse pressure decreases as we move away from the heart. So what's the definition of pulse pressure? It's the delta P between the systolic and the diastolic. Why does it diminish in absolute value as we move away from the heart? All right, explain. For, for example, in the, in the ventricle, it was massive. The LP was massive. Now, then we get down to, uh, by the way, give me a number. What is, del what is the pulse pressure uh, of the blood leaving the, or just pretty much at the aorta? What, what's the numerical value? 40. 40, all right. And so is it clear to everybody by the time we get over here, it's no longer 40? It's like my voice is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, why would that be? I think of all these analogies, but none of them seem to be terribly helpful. Um, what is dissipating the different, the, the, the change in the pressure? Another way of thinking about this, suppose your, your, your vascular system consisted of copper, copper pipes. Would this apply? What would be the difference? Less resistance in the copper pipes, or your, or your, or your, or your uh, actually be more resistance depending upon the, you know, depending upon the. Yeah, because the length. I mean, we we're talking about how. Length is the same. Right. right. Explain what you mean. Well, your blood vessels can expand and contract where the copper pipes are set. Yeah, and this. Remember our discussion of arteriosclerosis. What is arteriosclerosis? Just look at me. It's the blood vessels turning to copper pipes. That's what happens. The, the, the arteries harden, and that's one reason. It's not as bad as it used to be, because blood pressure tends to increase uh, in your aging patients, in your elderly patients. All right. But in addition to that, we're saying that the, that the delta P is diminishing because of the compliance. But I guess I still want to understand what's happening. Uh, if, if we had compliant vessels, what would probably, if the vessels were perfectly compliant, the pressure would drop to this point, and just we'll talk about this black line in a moment. But it would just basically drop to the lowest point and then continue down. We still, in the aorta and slightly distal to the aorta, still, by the way, we measure brachial blood pressure. Aren't you still getting a relatively high systolic pressure? Mm -hmm. So, what's can you think of anything that would be, be responsible for sustaining? that relatively high pressure even into the arms and legs. That would be an important point, but it's still a dynamic system and we're still, it's like a bouncing ball here, it's still conserving. The other thing I want you to think about, not only is the compliance, and Bob is exactly right about the compliance, but the proximal, the proximal arteries are also highly elastic. So what do I mean by elastic? 
right? So when they stretch, when they comply, when they yield, what do they want to do? Especially the order. They want to come back to their original diameter. <laughs> so when the aorta, when the aorta expands to accommodate for you, when it complies to the ventricular contraction, the aortic valve closes and the stretchiness of the aortic wall as it stretches, what's it going to want to do? Look at pressure. Yeah, come back. So that also acts to elevate the systolic or maintain the very high systolic pressure. Many of you have uh, well water. I don't, I don't mean the water's well. It comes from a well. So you can you explain? So you have a pump somewhere, right? right? And the pump, if it be usually down here at the source of the water, it could also be on top. Pumps the water up to your faucet, let's say. So if that were all there were to it, when you turned on the faucet in your kitchen, the pump would have to come on. That's going to take a delay, right? And then the water would be I used to live in a house where this happened. It would eventually come out and be all muddy and everything. You'd have to wait for it to uh, turn clear, and then you'd drink all you could. Um, that doesn't happen. Why? Oh. Um, one thing that happens is you have a big tank up there on top. And inside that tank, as the water is pumped into the, into the tank, there's something in that tank that maintains the pressure. What would that be? Any examples of this? There's a bladder in there. What do I mean by a bladder? It's like a hot water bottle. It's, a, it's like a sack. And so as that tank fills up with water, the bladder expands, and as it expands, it exerts, exerts a force um, um, on the water, helping to maintain the pressure so that when you turn on, the, turn on the faucet, we don't have to wait for that pump to increase the pressure again. Same idea here. Same idea is happening here. That elastic, the, the aorta is acting like an elastic bladder in the, in the uh, tank of the, um, some gas tanks tried this for a while. Cars also tried this to lower the workload of the fuel pump. I don't think they do that anymore. I don't think it worked out so well. Um, but in any case, uh, we're out of time, but I want to make sure just one last thing before we leave here. Uh, make sure you know pulse pressure, make sure you know systol systolic pressure, diastolic pressure, and then notice this black line. This black line, very uh, blue here, that's mean arterial pressure. Mean arterial pressure. Is that black line halfway between systolic and diastolic? No. Why isn't it? Diastole is twice as long. All right. So, so most of the cardiac cycle has been in diastole. Therefore, we have to come up with a formula, which we will next time, to lower this, depress it in favor of diastolic pressure over a systolic. So just make sure you understand that this black line, as you look at this very important figure, you want to spend some time with it. As we move to the distal vessels, uh, mean arterial pressure drops. You can see it drops all the way back to the right atrium. That was our whole point. That was the delta B from 93 down to almost zero. Uh, but it's not the simple mean of the systolic and uh, systolic and uh, diastolic pressures. All right, I'm going to go in the office and collapse. But in any case, uh, that's the end of the material, of course, for the for Monday's class.